we met in the bar at Nowra at the air station. I'd been posted there um, while Max was part of um, the A flight that was away at sea. So he came back with the flight and, uh, and I'd already been there for some time at Nowra, um, which was a sort of a fairly new event. There had only other been um, two, two other women who had gone to to Nowra as an air, air station. So the, the women, having the women on base was a fairly new event. Um, so yes, and so we, um, I, I found that um, as time went on, every time I turned around in the mess, he would be behind me. It took me a while to work out who this strange boy was. <laughs> but uh, so we met, we met while we were both serving at Albatross. I went there as the third officer, which was a sub-lieutenant equivalent, and I was promoted while I was there, so I was basically lieutenant, which was, um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so that, that was what I did. And I essentially was uh, the assistant secretary in the captain's office initially, and then I also was the unit officer for the, the women's side of life. Usually there were two um, female officer there. One was the the admin job that I had, but the main one was the unit officer to look after all the young women. Um, and that was pretty much what um, the serving women did um, all across the forces. We did the land jobs, looking after the women who invariably were either technical um, people, they were communicators, and they had their own offices, um, or um, all the admin jobs that the girls were employed on in the services at that time. That is something that I think I grew up with in, as long as, as, as other women did in those days. And we're going back now to the very early 60s. Um, the number of jobs that were open to women in those days were very limited. Um, so joining the Navy was something sort of fairly outrageous because you either had um, teaching and nursing were the professional jobs that were available um, on the whole and most of, most of uh, and then you had things like um, secretarial, retail and so on. But professions and jobs as, as a whole were very limited to women and leaving when you were married was a very common event. I mean, it sounds, you, you have to really sort of think how, how could have that have been the case, but it was common. So as a young woman growing up, choosing what you wanted to do if you wanted to work after school was a fairly serious thing. You were either pigeonholed or if you did something that was a bit adventurous in those days and run off and join the Navy, you were still in the same situation of once you married, that was the end of your career as such. It, it was common, so you grew up knowing that was going to happen. Um, it didn't make it any easier. And I think one of the things that gets forgotten too is that in those days, for young women and particularly young mothers, there was nothing like the support there is now because one, we all left home, left our families to join the Navy. So you didn't have that support that you might have if you um, were still at home living in the town you grew up in. Uh, and there was very, very little available in the way of childcare. So you really were on your own um, and it was not an easy road, particularly when the, the fellows left and went away for whatever reason, because they went away regularly. Going to Vietnam was something different which affected everybody in a different way. Um, I actually, and more probably in retrospect, count myself as being very lucky in those days. I, I grew up with a Navy family, in a Navy family. I joined the Navy myself. I was very 
much enamored of, of the services. Um, and I had a real sense that, you know, there was a the right way to do things and, and not. So there, there was a responsibility to be the stay at home um, person with the family, but also that if you did a good job of that, it meant that the guys could go and do a good job without worry, which they needed to be able to do in my mind. So um, the, the time when they went away, it was just another level up. And it reminded me very much of my mother and father who were children during, literally, I, they always said they were so young when they got married, we all grew up together, um, during the Second World War. So there was that sort of ethos in the family that I'd grown up with. Didn't necessarily make it any easier, but I did go home to a father <clears throat> who patted me on the shoulder and said, you'll be right, girl, you'll manage. Again, go back to the days where there, there was very little in the way of social welfare support or anything externally, and certainly not in the services. Um, you basically got on with life. The network that we did have that was very valuable was the network of supporting wives because it was really the only thing we had and it was very strong. And the other thing that happened too was when the guys were away at sea, whether, long before it was Vietnam, when the guys were away at sea, um, then the guys who weren't away at sea would be very helpful. They'd, make sure, you know, that he could mow your lawn or so that, that sort of thing. So there was the service family that was, was really good that looked after you in that sense. But from a personal point of view, it was really, I mean, it, it sounds corny, but it was really stiff up a lip, lip, lip stuff. You, you, get, you got on with it. You didn't make a fuss. Um, and you coped with what needed to be done. And they got to hear about it eventually, but it was usually sort of as part of a joke, something dreadful had happened at home. But, you know, small things like the washing machine blowing up and whatever were <laughs> no cause for alarm. Um, and and that, was, that was part of it. I guess there was a certain sort of, sense of independence and, and pride in being able to, to get on and do it. And, and we had good examples because our mothers went through the Second World War. Um, and if you had any close family ties like that, um, they were a pretty good example. My dad had been a, a Bernardo's boy in England when he was young. And when it came time to leave, when Max went off to um, Vietnam, it meant because I had just left, or I'd been out of the Navy about eight months myself, I suppose. But I didn't, and I could have gone back in, but I really didn't want to do that. It was sort of like the end of an era. And, and I had this notion that I'd like to run off and do um, volunteers abroad for a, a year but their year didn't coincide with Max's year away. So then I thought, oh, I'll go and check out Bernardo's. So I ended up being a house mother for a year. Um, and that was, that was great because there were six, six kids we had. I was just the assistant, I wasn't, wasn't in charge. But in any event, we had, um, yeah, we had, I had a family for that year. And that was, that was a great thing to have to do, to be able to do. Lots of kids to cuddle and it was good. Bernardo's are a worldwide organisation, started in England years ago, um, basically look after kids who are either orphans, started off specifically for orphans, um, but over the years developed for kids who were from needy families and and whatever. So I think, I don't think there were any orphans in our home, but their families weren't able to look after them for whatever reason. 
they are all allowed to take two two different weeks of RNA. Or was, yeah, I think they were close to a week. But in any event, um, he he basically decided that he would prefer to wait and do um, do it after eight months, and then have a, a, a second one a bit later. Um, I think they were, they had a week. By the time they were actually flown home, flown back again, we probably had five days. Um, so yes, he came to Sydney both times, and I was working in Sydney. We were pretty good at hello goodbye. It was different. I, it was totally different from what became um, family comings and goings in later life, and the. Difference was always the there was the element of this was not a trip away to fly aeroplanes on and off an air ca aircraft carrier or that type of thing. This was serious, um, and it could well happen that he didn't come home, or he could come home in bits. It was it wasn't like anything else because this was real life, you know, serious stuff. Um, and and this is where I think I appreciated my father because he we didn't talk about it in, in massive detail and we didn't need to because he knew as well as I did that that was the underlying thing. So uh, it was different. Things that you sort of read about now, but actually did happen. Walking down um, walking down the street in the city, a car backfired. It would be. Um, and for Max, it would have been infinitely more difficult than it was for me because I was in my home ground um, and he was coming back from a situation that um, you could only imagine and probably it, it not very well. Um, so that, I think, from a Vietnam experience was something that has always been adrift. Um, there was no sense of anybody having any understanding of what it was like for them while it happened, and certainly none when they came home, which made it extraordinarily difficult for personal relationships. Um, and anyone who thinks they came home and the war finished is sadly mistaken because it doesn't end. And talk to their children and they'll tell you the same, it doesn't end. And the great tragedy, I think, with all of that was that nobody, including the service, including the Navy in this case, nobody was prepared to actually live with it afterwards. Um, and they still aren't. The only people who write about it are academics or people who were actually there. And the trouble now is so much water has gone onto the bridge that a lot of the damage, personal damage, that happened could have been avoided if based on everything that was learned during the First World War particularly, but also the Second World War, about how do you treat people when they've been to war and they come back into normal life, if there is such a thing, and how do you prepare families to be, to be able to deal with that, but also to be practically of some use? We are terrible at it. As a civilization, we don't um, we don't learn how to die very well, but we certainly have no notion of how to deal with um, the people who actually go to war. And if we had, then you would find that those poor souls who finished up the, in um, Afghanistan they wouldn't be having anything like the trouble that they are now because we still don't know how to deal with it. Or if we I say we don't know how to deal with it, we don't prepare to deal with it. 
So um, how did we deal with it in King's Cross for a week? Probably not very well. As an aside, our son, when he was still in the army, um, he went to Timor when that kerfuffle was on. Um, and we were astounded that this gorgeous sounding young woman came on the phone from East Sail. Um, and she said uh, she was from the family um, care, care unit, basically. And, and we had um, a son, you know, going to Timor. So she just wanted to check in and say, would we like to go to the morning tea that was being put on for all the, the relatives? Um, and would we like a care package and all this sort of thing? And I'm sitting there at my desk working and I'm listening to this lovely young thing on the phone. And I'm thinking how things have changed. Um, and I mean, that was a long time ago now, obviously, but it was such a departure from anything that we had ever experienced. So I felt like clapping and giving her a cuddle. And it was really funny because not long after, um, a package arrived and it was a, a package designed for children. It had pencils and a, a, a drawing book, a colouring book in it, like well, Daddy's in his outfit and he's off to wherever he's off to. And, yeah, so there's obviously lots of things have changed if you're a family from when we were young things, which is, you know, a good, a good, good to see.